when you meet the guru, when you meet God, how do I say it? What's become dumb at the door of the spirit? You know, Swami opened my heart, but he came in that dream full of light and energy. He was robed in radiant red, all glory. And then he waved his hand. I never knew Swami has that mannerism of waving hands, but he waved his hand and that energy just drew me whoosh, to himself. And then he hugged me. Our father is here. The, the, we are passing through the most auspicious, gracious moment in the history of creation. Not just history of mankind, but the history of the whole creation. God in his full embodiment is here with us. Why worry? Be happy. Be. Being is that, that emptiness whereby you allow, allow, allow God to take over you. That is my message. Amen. Welcome to Soul Journeys. His is an amazing story. Father Charles Ogata, a Catholic priest from Nigeria, discovered in Indian holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba a greater love for all people, a boundless love for Baba, and an even deeper love for Jesus. Father Ogata's greatest desire is to bring Sai Baba's teaching of divine spiritual oneness to all Christians, to all people. This interview was recorded in Sai Baba's ashram in India in January of 2006. We're in the heart of the abode of peace, Prashanti Nilayam in Puttaparthi, India. And here you are, a Catholic priest from Nigeria. I want to ask you, completely unrelated to Sai Baba and your Catholic priesthood, the first question. What kind of a little boy were you? So I'm his boy. From the very beginning? Yeah. Um, even Swami surprised me in his uh, discourse, Christmas discourse. Remember he said, in fact, he told me that I had known him from, right from my childhood. Even though you weren't conscious of him? Yeah, even though I was not conscious of it. And that, that was a very big opening to me because I remember that I had never had People usually have a transition when they come to see, meet Swami, a transition period whereby there is doubt. How do you reconcile Jesus with Swami? Where does Swami fit in Jesus? But that never happened to me. It was for me a flow. It was for me like um, a remembrance that Swami was everything to me. And then when he said that also, my childhood memories flashed back to me because my childhood memories were the most beautiful experiences I've ever had in life. I was like in bliss all through, right from age five to age 11. You were a good little boy. <laughs> well, Swami was the, 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 the bliss of my soul. I was, um, I was having a lot of spiritual experiences which myself I couldn't understand and my parents also couldn't understand. What kind of experiences? My body used to be very hot, very hot that I have to pour water on myself. It's so hot that they take me to all kinds of hospitals and there is no medical explanations. And then they started taking me to the um, juju, African jujus, because they thought I was possessed. And then they did a lot of things to me. Sometimes I'm taken up and lose consciousness. In fact, one of the, one of the one of the times it happened that I lost consciousness, my mom was with someone, a friend. We live in a hill, in the mountain, surrounded by trees, very, very serene. So my mom had gone to visit someone, and the, when the experience started, someone ran to him, and ran to, ran to her and told her that it had started. And she was so worried and started running, and before she could climb the hill, she fainted, you know? And uh, it was really a big experience for her and for everyone. That experience was with me until the age of 11, when it left me. So you had these early, early childhood spiritual experiences. Sure, sure. And 
at a young boy or a teenager, when did you first, when do you first remember the wish to become a Catholic priest? That's a good question. I could remember when I was 11, my dad, my dad is also a very spiritual person. Very, very serene, very, very humble. Catholic family? Catholic, we, you know, we, I'm born in a Catholic family. So he called me, one day he called me inside his room and held my hands. And after saying a very beautiful prayer, she spit it in my hands and closed it as a, a sign of his blessing, a sign that he has given, he has poured in everything that he is in me. And then he asked me a question. He asked me, would you want to be a priest? And I said, no. <laughs> you know, because I said no, because if I had said yes, I would go to the, to the seminary to train, junior seminary. Normally there's a junior seminary and then the higher seminary. So because I said no, I went to an ordinary school, you know, for my education. Yeah. So when I finished, it was five years training, high school. When I finished, I did so well. I really had very fantastic results. Everyone was proud of me, including my dad. And I was preparing to go and read medicine in the university. You know? You were going to be a doctor? Yeah, yeah. That was my dream. And everyone was really, really very happy. Everyone looked up to me. I was, I was also the first born son of the family. And we are nine in the family. <laughs> How could your father send you to school to be a doctor? It would be very expensive. Yeah, but, but it's worth it because he loved me so much. He really loved me so much. So it was during that time. So you thought your career would be that of medicine. Sure. So then what happened to change your mind? I used to love solitude. Naturally, not because of any religious sentiments. I used just to be alone or just withdraw into the forest and just be. With eight brothers and sisters, I understand why. <laughs> well, that was my habit. <laughs> and uh, it was when I was waiting, normally because I had come to that, you know, there are certain times in your life when you are totally relaxed by, because there, is, there are nothing at stake. Mm -hmm. Everything, I, has, I had gotten everything, and then I was relaxed in those moments. So, I went, I was alone by myself, and all of a sudden, this strange force seized me. It filled me with so much love, so much energy, that I, my, I couldn't contain it. What was it? How can you explain? <laughs> it's such a mysterious force, but I knew it was a good force, because it, I, I got in contact with my inner self, you know? And then there came a voice, strong and clear, full of love, that said, what would you want to do with this life? It was an inner voice, not an outer it, voice. It was, well, wherever, I, I didn't know the source, where it was coming from, but it filled me. Actually, I was one with that voice. And what did you answer? The voice also answered. It wasn't as if I was answering, but the voice also answered, what else, Father? but to give this life to you, to God. So from then, immediate, from that moment, everything, everything became non-existent to me. The whole world was like blind to me. And I could not sleep, I could not eat, I could not do anything. I was totally possessed by that force, you know? I became so thin, you know, because I, di I, don't, I didn't derive any joy in any other thing, even eating and sleeping, except to be alone with that voice that filled me with so much joy. Just to be in your heart, alone, yeah. no people, no noise, with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not that, also, there's, there was something that started happening to me at that moment. It was like I was one with everything, because I couldn't also stand the suffering of other people then. I couldn't stand it because I was feeling the suffering inside me. And there was much suffering around you and your course, community? Of so, so much suffering. Like, like if I'm going to the mass, normally I wake up very early in the morning, like around 4 o'clock to go to mass, which is about 10 kilometers away from where we live. In the morning, no fear, nothing, because I was one with everything. 
But if I see someone, for example, there are uh, mad people on the road, I can't withstand them standing naked. I will just rush back home, get my clothes, and then come and put, <laughs> <laughs> put on them. It was, it was, I was so overtaken by that force that it was everything for me. How long did it take before you realized you wanted to switch from medicine to becoming a priest? It didn't take long. I mean, it didn't take time. It was that moment. Because the world then became dead to me. Then I told my dad that I was not going to go to the university again. That, but rather that I would, I would give my life to, to in service to God. And everyone was disappointed. It was like a shock because Remember, 11, remember, about seven years ago, he had asked me whether I want to be a priest. So yes. they, have, they, they have built up their psyche you know, towards me becoming a someone, doctor. You know, a doctor and someone very, very responsible. I mean, in the African tradition also, the firstborn child is looked up to to take care of the whole family. Mm -hmm. So they were looking up to me, proud of me, to really come out so um, um, big in the family. You would be a doctor, you would be making money, you could take care of their physical problems and their financial problems, sure. and sure. even their spiritual problems. Sure. So my dad advised me. He is very, a very, very serene man, very, very, has a lot of wisdom too. He had advised me, he called me inside again, and I was with him, and he advised me, why not go to the university first? And if after your studies, if this voice, if this power still persists, then you will really, really be sure that it is true, it is genuine. Did you do it? I knew I can't do it. You couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I, I cannot even withstand a second of separation, you know, from that, from that voice. So you it's didn't impossible. do it? I do. I, well, I didn't want to disappoint my dad. Yeah because he loved me so much and I loved him also. So what I did, I told the voice, well, it is your job. <laughs> Go and convince him, <laughs> you know? And he was true. The, voice was, was tr the voice was true to you know, his, his power. Because also, on another occasion, my dad called me and it was like the voice spoke through me and said to my dad, look, if this is coming from God, then you are truly blessed because what he could have done for you will be done hundred times over. As a priest. As a priest. Not as, you know, you know yeah, as a priest. Not really as a priest, but my, my aim was not really to be a priest as such. But I was looking for an environment whereby I can express this yearning to serve, to give my life. And the only, you know, within my, the, my environment, the only um, forum that gives that opportunity is the priesthood. Then I chose to, to join the, the religious order of the Holy Ghost Fathers and Brothers. It's an yeah, in Lagos or where? No, 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 it's an international religion. We are all over the world, mm -hmm. in all the continents and countries in the world. And they are noted for strict, strict religious discipline. We take vows of poverty, obedience, and their chastity. And we go to the poorest of the poor. That's their mission, to go to the poorest of the poor to spread the message of Christ's kingdom. And then when they go, they forget the family. They can, you can be sent in to a mission and you will stay there 30 years and die there. <laughs> <laughs> so also my dad also told me, okay, if you're going to be a priest, why not join the local ones? Why go to somewhere, somewhere <laughs> we are not going to see you for, for so many years? You know? But I really wanted to give everything, mm -hmm. everything to God. You know? So you become a priest. How old were you? How old were you? When I became a priest. Uh -huh. Um, 28. And did you love being a priest? Sure. But to answer the question better, I love God. And because, or, or rather God loved me. <laughs> it's a better way because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, drinking in his love. And that love is the joy of my priesthood. You know, of my, you know, when you talk about priesthood, is, is, uh, you're talking about um, giving yourself in total surrender to mm -hmm. God. Yeah. So you were a priest from the age of 28. You took all these vows. You were working with the poorest among the poor. 
And as I heard you say so well, when you addressed tens of thousands of people on Christmas Day in front of Sai Baba, that you never went looking for Sai Baba. Sai Baba found you. How did that happen? <laughs> Truly, that is the truth. Sai Baba found me. Because when I was in this, I was, when I was in the seminary, true, I was searching for God. At a time, that inner, inner voice, that communion, that presence left me. And when it left me, because it is the only thing I valued, it is the only thing that gives me, gave meaning to my life, it is the only reason for my existence. Why did it leave you? I don't know, ask it. <laughs> <laughs> so when it left, that was the darkest night of my life. Because I was, when the world was dead to me, and then the spiritual life also was dead to me. Then I was like scorching, no background, no food. I knew I could not survive. Actually, I wanted to leave the seminary. I, had, I started contemplating leaving the seminary. You no longer heard that voice. Not hearing, when you say hearing, it is like a presence. It's not like physical hearing. It is like a presence that fills you and that you know that, that you are one with all. You and are one with God. Yeah. And it's unmistakable. Sure. And you, it stopped. Yeah. So then what did you do? I wanted to leave because I could not survive. When you are depressed, for example, I'll just give you a little example. When you are depressed, totally depressed, you can't even rise from the bed. When you wake up in the morning, you can't even pull your body out of the bed. Now, now imagine my dark night. I was literally drawing myself to move, even to go to pray. There is no meaning in the prayers. There is no meaning in all the teachings. It is so dry. I was scorching. The death was better. So then my dad got sick, very, very sick with cancer D during that time. And I tell you, it was also Swami's miracles. I was told in the seminar that he is sick and he wants to see me. So I got permission to go home. And the day I could remember vividly the day I entered the room. And he looked straight in my eyes, so piercingly. And tears rolled from his eyes and my eyes. And we spoke without words. Because we have been so close. Even when I went to the seminary, when I was in the novitiate, he used to come every month. We were allowed one, one day <laughs> visit in a month. He used to come every month and we would go and sit quietly. And while we were talking, he would start crying. He must have loved you very much. He really very loved much. me. <laughs> so when I saw him, and because he had cancer of the bone marrow, mm -hmm. he can't sit down, he can't stand up, he can't, he can't lie down. Everywhere aches. But in his eyes was a Eureka. Eureka. He found something beyond suffering. Oh. And you realize that beyond suffering, there is a level of our existence that we get in contact with God whereby nothing really pains. One day, just the day the doctors confirmed that he had cancer. He called me in the evening and told me he's a teacher. So he told me to get a pen and write what he's going to say. There was light in his eyes. But I was sad because, you know, they told me that he can't survive for two weeks. You know, so I was sad and I thought he wanted to write his will. In the morning he asked me what the doctor said and I told, I told him, they said you are getting better. <laughs> so, but, he started with this eulogy of God's love and praising God's power and splendor and the, 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 the beauty of creation. When he was writing. This I was writing. And then he said, I am on the way to Calvary. I'm on the way. I'm to on my way to Calvary. I'm on my journey to Calvary. To Calvary. To Calvary. And he said, you know what's Calvary? Where yes. Jesus was killed. Yes. And he said, when Jesus was on his own way to Calvary, he fell a number of times, but he did not give up. 
He, each time he failed, he rose up and took his cross until he reached Calvary. I never knew that when you reach Calvary, you die. <laughs> <laughs> of course, when, you carry, when Jesus carried his cross to Calvary, he didn't return. He came. So he saw his death. And then he said to me, pray for me and book masses for me. Novena masses. Yes. For courage and strength to be able to reach Calvary. Mm. And then he said, I am offering these sufferings for the joy of the world. Luca Samasta. Sukino Bavanto. Never, I never knew that expansion of consciousness whereby you are not even offering the suffering for your own selfish reasons. You are not offering the sufferings for, for, for a family or whatever, but for the joy of the world. That was a journey. His suffering was an awakening to me. And you were still in, your, in the midst of your own depression. Well, you know, when, 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 you, when you meet something that is greater than, you know, where, for example, if you, you have a pain in your leg and then you have a toothache, <laughs> then you forget the pain in your leg, <laughs> isn't it? You know, his suffering took over, mm -hmm. you know, my depressions. You know, I was totally engrossed in how to make him happy, how to, but I even prayed to God to, to give me his sufferings. So you forgot your own depression. Sure, sure. And his lessons to you you said he was a teacher yeah he was a teacher it sounds like his biggest lessons to you were at the end of his life sure his end the end of his life was not just a lesson but a revelation because he knew on one day he told us we were three we had all, we had transferred to another hospital big hospital about six six hours journey to our home myself my mom and my brother so on one day he he called us and told us, I'm going to leave this body on Wednesday. Inga happened on Wednesday. That's in my, 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 my language. I'm going to leave this body on Wednesday. Of course, you know, you can't believe him. You know. <laughs> How would and, he know? <laughs> and my mom started crying. My mom started crying and, and said, Dear me, please don't die. And he said, I'm not dying. Where I'm going is better for you. And when I reach, I will say, our Father for you, give us this day our daily bread. And he was true to his name. Wednesday he died. Wednesday? Well, be even before Wednesday, he told us, don't allow anybody inside the room. Only priests and religious people. This is very, very important too. Because the vibrations of people affect the journey of the soul, especially at the last moment of when the soul wants to depart the body. Never knew that. And, and he said, Light the candles because angels are here. Because and, angels are yeah, here. And keep on praying. And on that Wednesday, he called me. First of all, he, he said in the, around 3 o'clock, he told me to go and buy banana for him. Then he was not eating again. He was only on, on fluids. But because I loved him, I went to buy the banana. It was raining heavy, very mighty torrent. And when I reach the market, everyone has departed the market except one woman selling only one bunch of banana. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't go myself, I would doubt it. But I was, I was experiencing this. And I, with fear, I bought the banana and rushed back to him. When I reached, he said, peel one. Peel one. I peeled one and gave to him. And he ate it. Later on, when I met Swami, when I came to, to start reading Swami's books, the Satisai Speaks, I read where Swami said, the body is like a banana. For you to eat the Atma, you have to peel the body. <laughs> <laughs> then what, the experience of my dad, what, that action, that symbolism dawned on me. That he is not really dying, but rather peeling the body. And then after eating it, he said to me, it is time, come. And then he told my mom and my dad to stand at the foot, the foot of the, the bird. He told your mom and your... And, and my brother. Your brother. To stand at the foot of the bird. And then he called me by his side and gave me his hand. By the way, I have to tell you something. Because when I talk about the power of God's name, that is the greatest power on earth. Especially 
for liberation in the age in which we are. It was my dad who first taught me the power of God's name. Never a moment did he, did the, 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 the name of God leave his, leave his lips. He was calling Jesus Mary, Jesus Mary, Jesus my love, Jesus, Jesus. One day, <laughs> one day, there was a, a, a patient, another patient, who was really very, you know, he is at the moment of, we are in the in a, um, um, intensive unit. So the other patient is suffering from, from diabetes and his legs has been cut up to the hip. So my dad was busy calling this name and all of a sudden he just shouted, this Mary you are calling, when, when will she come? <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> No, because she has been, he has been calling and calling. And at times when we have to, 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 to turn his body because of bed sore, you know, yes. we have to turn his body and he undergoes a lot of, a lot of uh, pain during those times. And he will not call during those times. When he recovers, the first thing he does is to pray to God to forgive him for not calling his <laughs> name. While he was unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> so when he gave me his hand, he told me to start chanting the names of God. We started chanting the litany of the sacred heart of Jesus. It's like the 108 names. And then while we were chanting, he was replying. I would say, I will chant and then he will reply, like, have mercy on me. Blessed and, be God, blessed be his holy name. Yeah. And after a time, he stopped talking. But you see the bread merge. And after a time, the bread went up. I felt it went up, and then he closed his mouth, closed his eyes, and left the body. So his suffering, his death was like telling me there's something deeper. There's something deeper in life. And before he died, he said to me, don't leave the priesthood. <laughs> Many will come to you. So when, after his burial, I went back to the seminary, and that was when Swami came to me. And how did Swami come to you in the Catholic seminary? Well, someone, a teacher, we were, to, we were to have a course in comparative religion. And there was this priest who told me later on that he had found his, he has won his freedom. His name is Reverend Father Aras Raymond. And he was to teach us a course. So during one of his lectures, he mentioned the name Sai Baba. Really? Yeah. It's just the name. And that name did something inside me. As I said, it shook the very foundations of heaven within me. I couldn't contain it. I don't know why. It was like a memory. You know, it was like a reliving of past experiences. It woke something up. It woke something up. It woke me from my slumber and stupor. Just the name. Just the name. And then I started to devour. I was like mad. Every little available literature, of course, there are very, very little, you know, in <clears throat> African seminary. For, but from that priest, I got some, some literature, and I started reading. I started, it was like I was at the threshold of the truth. Something was telling me, I'm, I'm hitting it. <laughs> <laughs> then, Swami came in my dream. You didn't even know what he looked like. No, 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 I knew. I've seen his picture. Oh, okay. You saw his picture in sure, the book. Sure, sure. And he came in he your came, dream. But I never knew his mannerisms, you know. So many things I didn't know. But he came in the dream, and that dream was in Puttapati. Because I saw, it was when I came to Puttapati that I realized that that dream was here. In the interview room, all the houses, especially DD2. DD2 <laughs> is a shed. It's a shed. As far back as you can go, yeah. there must be 40 buildings here that house people. Nice flats, nice apartments, four and five stories tall. And in the very far back reaches of the ashram, it's a huge campus, yeah. there's the last shed, yeah. DD2. DD2. And you yeah. saw that in sure. your dream? Sure, sure. And when you came here? Then it, I confirmed, because that dream was like, it, it, was, it was more than a dream. When I call it a dream, it's just to, to use the common balance that we all understand. But he came in that dream full of light and energy. He was robed in radiant red, all oh, glory. And then he waved his hand. 
I never knew Swami has that mannerism of waving hands, but he waved his hand, and that energy just drew me whoosh, to himself. And then he hugged me. When he hugged me, I dissolved. In your dream? In, well, yeah, in the dream. I dissolved. I lost every individuality of the self. Like, the, you, you put salt in water. Yes. It just dissolves. I dissolved in, his, in the ocean of his love. And then, within that experience, without speaking, he said, I am the one that you've been looking for. Without speaking? You heard him say, yeah. I am the one you've been looking for. You know, for. when I say without speaking, there are things that are beyond words. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> there are things that, it was like I merged in, the, in himself. He revealed himself to me, and I knew without any reason, how do you know that he is your father or he is your mother? It's not by reason, you know. You naturally know, intuitively know that this is my dad and that love flows. So he revealed himself to me and I knew without reason that he is the very source of my soul, my very life principle, the truth that I have ever looked for. And when I woke up, that was everything. And there would probably be nobody in the seminary to share that beautiful dream. I don't need to share. <laughs> because no one will understand. No one will understand. No one will appreciate it. I discovered my secret. And I was beaming. You know? <laughs> I was really, really beaming with life and joy. Was there any contradiction in your heart, in your soul, and in your consciousness between Sai Baba, who came to you in your dream so beautifully, and Jesus? Contradiction? Yes. <laughs> Did you feel all, like you were... When, when he came, all contradictions, not only, not only, you know, all contradictions dissolved. In that dissolvement, when I dissolved in him, all my questions vanished. And what remained was just answers. All my <laughs> questions vanished. You know. So then what did you do? Well, I wanted to, to come. I wanted to... I would, then my soul started pining, pining to be with him, pining for his physical dashing, you know. And, and something happened. When, when this happened, I was full, you know. You know, when you discover the treasure, you know, people are busy, you know, but I knew my treasure. And there was an order from Rome. There's an order from Rome. From Rome. A special order from Rome, from our international con no, no, headquarters in Rome, to the seminary in which I'm, I was being trained. Mm -hmm. The seminary is uh, Spiritual International School of Theology. Okay. And this school is an international school. There are about 12 nationalities from different cultures. So it's really a model seminary. So this order came for, for the students to make a positive contribution in their process of formation. Okay. Remember, the system is, is such that people come with um, people come with the quest, the love to find God. But it is all bookish knowledge. When you read and read and read, the head blows up, and then the heart dries. There is no experiential knowledge, experiential uh, 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 awareness of divinity. I don't know whether you get the, what I'm trying to say. Yes. Because the, the, there is like here when... They use when, their head instead of their heart. They think and they don't feel. Not exactly. They try to feel, but there, the system does not really... In, like in, this, in, the, in the Indian system whereby you have realized souls, sages who have tested, and they are they're able to open your heart to test the, the, the nectar. There are no models. Even the teacher is also seeking. <laughs> You know, so because of that, the seminarians find it difficult to harmonize their inner spiritual calling with the practical you know, um, uh, experiences in the seminary. So when that order came, it was an opportunity for us to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. In fact, we titled the, doc the document, The Moment of Grace. Okay. And the seminarians made me their coordinator, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> So, and it was such a beautiful document that we produced. It's incredible. 
we really work day and night to express ourselves. You know, the disharmony between thought, word, and action. What we read, what, what, you know, the, the, what our motivations are not being fulfilled. You know, there's a very big contrast between what is lived and what, and what we, you know, uh, the ideal, the spiritual ideas that we were supposed to arrive at. Now, when we produced this document, there was a committee sent from Rome to assess it. And they took it. They approved it. When they left, they said, this guy is a dangerous man. <laughs> you, you put together such beautiful words. They loved it. They approved it. They took it no, back no, to No, 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 no. It's not, it's, not it's not Rome, but the seminary authorities. OK. The rectors, the priests, they say, if you allow him to be ordained a priest, he's going to turn everything upside down. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you are a dangerous man. <laughs> so, and, the, and the rector actually said, it is either I'm dead that he's ordained a priest. It's either I'm dead, flat, that he's ordained a priest. So they gave a flimsy reason and expelled me. From the seminary? Yeah, then I was a deacon. You were a deacon on yeah. the way to becoming a priest? A priest. They expelled me. But that was not the end of the story. Because when they expelled me, the other students said, expel us too. Because <laughs> we all wrote the document. We all signed it. In fact, it was such a traumatic moment in the life of the seminarians. Mm. As so, in fact, to tell you the, the extent of what they went through, during prayers, during prayers, when more than 250 seminarians gather in the oratory, the priest will say, the Lord be with you. And no one will say a word. And it's also with you. They wouldn't say they that. They wouldn't say. They say, which Lord are you giving us? When your word is, doesn't correspond to your action. So it will, and then all of a sudden they will start crying. You see one sobbing. So it was an act of defiance in support of you sure. for being kicked sure. out. Sure. And then when they discover that they cannot run the seminary again, they did one thing. Because when they get the highest on the deacons, because we are about 18 deacons, when they get the deacons, then they will be able to, to get the, the, the junior semina seminarians. So they called all the deacons in a round conference you know, you know, meeting. One by one, you enter and you face all the priests the director, the, the, the formation director, and all of them with very stern faces. And then they will give you a document to read. That document, in summary, says if you are for him, you sign. If you are not for him, you just walk out. So after you, you they, they came one by one. And after they had read, you read, and then you either sign or you walk out. Eleven signed. And when they signed, that day they were, they were expelled, 11 deacons. The other six that didn't sign were ordained priests. Mm. But I was very happy when they expelled me. <laughs> I was, because I found Swami. In fact, I started planning to come. I went to a, a Benedictine monastery about six hours from the seminary just to be alone and to plan my coming to the party. But before I left, I wrote another document, which is about 36 you know, pages, mm -hmm. to Rome, mm -hmm. to explain, to explain what really happened. Because be, behind everything said, there are a lot of things that are unsaid. So that Rome will know the background, because they are given other, other reasons for expelling these 12, you know, these 12 uh, deacons. So, when I wrote, I left. When the Superior General received it in Rome, he flew immediately to Nigeria. He did? Sure. The superior general of your order sure. flew. He flew immediately to Nigeria. And then when immediately he reached, he asked, where is Charles Ogada? They don't know where I was. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. <laughs> so they started looking for me, say, bring him to there. So they started looking for me, and they, they were able to contact the other Others, you know, deacons that were in exile, and through them, they were able to contact me and told me to come that day, that under vow of obedience, because the superior general wants me. I was sad, <laughs> but I had to obey him. When I, when I came, I had about an hour audience with him, and he said, 
the documents you people have written has been has been adopted in the whole formative as a model for the whole formative process in the in the world. How beautiful. And then he gave he used his veto because you don't do that in the church. The church is so structured that you move you have to move through steps. You don't can, authority does not contradict authority. So it, he really used his veto. I know it's Swami's grace because it has never happened in the history of the church. He said, call him back, call the other 12 deacons back and ordain them that same year. Remember wow. the, other, the other deacons had been ordained. Yes. Ordain them that same year and then set another is because we ordained them without even exams. <laughs> 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 so it is after ordination that we wrote our master's exams. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so you, were, you were ordained then at that time? Yeah. So I was ordained, including the other 11 deacons, we were ordained. Oh, that's so beautiful. And the, after the ordination, I was posted. Then I, ha I had no freedom again, because you have to obey the orders of your archbishop, your superiors, and so on. So I was posted to the Archdiocese of Lagos. There, I was working in a parish, St. Michael's Catholic Parish, you know, and I was, I was pining to get just one, because we were entitled to one month leave every year. And you were still hoping to go to Puta Party. That was my, my home. <laughs> so, so, I was, so you took your one month leave yeah. after you were posted at St. Michael's Church. Yeah. Were you the associate pastor or the pastor? I was the associate pastor. And you jumped on an airplane and flew to India straight <laughs> I ran <laughs> do you remember that year what year was that's that? 2001 2001 yeah okay so you arrive in India yeah was he in Puttaparthi or Bangalore Puttaparthi you got on a bus or a cab and you came to Puttaparthi yeah and then what happened I broke down in fact when I saw Swami's form that was he in fact the, the moment I arrived Swami was being offered Arati Arati. And I broke down sobbing, really uncontrollable. And then <laughs> Swami showered upon me the love of infinite mothers. It's unbelievable. You were probably in the far back of the Darshan Hall. Well, um, no, I was either in the second or third row. Oh, you got up that close. Uh, for Darshan, not this, not that not, not, not same day. Swami did not come. Okay, all right. This is another day. Yeah, this is here. another day. Swami glided. I was not actually expecting Swami to call me. It was just to look at His glory. It filled me totally. But Swami called you. Yeah, He glided, and He, he glided to where I was. <laughs> he glided, <laughs> and then said, "Where are you from?" <laughs> I said, "Swami from Nigeria." I said, "How many are you?" I said, "Swami one." <laughs> <laughs> and said, go. Oh then, my goodness. Then I jumped up, you know, and then I went, I went. That first interview, there are a lot of things that happened, but you know, that, let me just tell you the first interview, which was also very, very significant in my life. You know, when we went, when we you know, arrived at the first, the, the, the interview room, we all seated, the, the, the gents on one side and the ladies on the other side. And then Swami came so loving, so jovial. And then he started, he first of all, he materializes vibhuti for the ladies. And then he started joking with people and then I was answering people's questions. But I was totally absorbed in his glory. I was just, my eyes couldn't just you know, get turned out from, from his face. And then once in a while, he would look at me with a type of lucky look, you know, like, <laughs> like, like that, and ignore me. And then, all of a sudden, as if to wake me up from my, my bliss, he said, how are your wives? <laughs> <laughs> what wives, Swami? I was shaking, you know. Inside me, I knew he knows. He knows everything, you know. So I was, I was, I was trying to mouth, you know, to mumble. Or to try to tell Swami, I'm a priest, you know, I, I don't even have a wife, not to talk about wives, you know, <laughs> and he ignored me. Then, normally, Swami calls me last. He will call everyone, and then everyone will think that the, the interview is finished, and then all of a sudden he said, come. Then when we went inside the interview room, Swami said to me, 
Sometimes you want to marry, sometimes no. Don't worry, you are mine. Oh. You know, those words were the consummation of all my aspirations. Those words you my Swami became for me not a god. He became for me the bride of my soul. He became for me my companion, my 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 beloved. Like the song of songs, you know, like Rama and and the and the and the, and the, and the uh, sister, you know. He became everything for me, and he, he that experience was the beginning of my spiritual transformation, especially as a Catholic priest who has taken the vows of celibacy, Brahmacharya. So even though you had gone through seminary, you had been ordained, you were on your way to being an associate parish priest, it was that moment with Swami that made you blossom the most in your spiritual sense. Sure, sure. It was like an awakening. It was an awakening. And Swami did so many things. He is incredible and he said to me you're not going to understand what swami is doing to you now and i don't know whether i have understood now <laughs> well tell me more anything else you remember about that one-on-one -on -one experience with swami where you had such a uh, major shift in your own awareness of god in that private interview there are so many things. Some are um, so mind-boggling. The, <coughs> the, the first thing, the real thing that really, Swami initiated me in the spiritual path. You were already initiated into the spiritual path. Sure, sure. But when you meet the Guru, when you meet God, how do I say it? The words become dumb at the door of the spirit. You know, Swami opened my heart. He, he, my heart was exploded. And all my thought and words was just to please him, to love him, to, 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 to do his will. You know, so... Um, you know, in the Catholic system, we, the priests are trained to be celibates. That's brahmacharya. It's in every religion. Mm -hmm. The priests are trained to be brahmacharya. But we are not taught how to be brahmacharya. <laughs> so you discover that there is a suppression of energy. There is a repression of energy that also makes some of the priests very, very dejected and and when energy is suppressed, it comes out in a very dangerous form. Sure. There is a very l big system. For example, we are taught to be brahmacharyas. For example, what you eat also determines the, the, the energy of your, of your system. For example, we eat meat. We eat all sorts of junks. Then how can you be a brahmacharya when you, you eat all those junks? It's not possible. You are burning the candle, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, both, both sides. Mm -hmm. And then there is a systematic scientific method of channeling the energy so that the energy is one, but you have to channel it up so that it merges in God. When it merges in God, you become a child. When you are with a woman, you are a woman. When you are with a, you're with a man, you are a man. When you are with a child, you are a child. Because you are like Christ, Christ-like. Child, childlike simplicity. But that energy has to be channeled up. Swami initiated me in that process of channeling energy. And so you, that when you are, all your thoughts are absorbed totally in God, the energy is up. It's the yogic method you know, that the, the, the Hindu system teaches. But not yoga as type of sitting like that, you know. It is yoga of devotion, pure absorption in the love of the beloved. Father Charles, Sir. Christmas Day, you told your story before tens of thousands of peoples in Sai Baba. I have to imagine your superiors, the Vatican, the Catholic Church knows you love Sai Baba and that you love Jesus. For is me, they are one. <laughs> for them, is it one or is it a problem? 
for them officially, officially it is a problem. Officially, for them. You know, but for me, it is not a problem. And my prayer, of course, to Swami is to, because I, what, that I came to Swami is not by my own power or, or righteousness or whatever. It is Swami's grace. His grace is so abundant. And then we pray to Swami to help the Christian church to help us to reveal himself, to remove this cloud of Maya that he uses to cover his, his, his reality from us. When that happens, you, there's no more doubt. Remember Jesus, we did the same thing to Jesus. We, we didn't take Jesus seriously. It was the same authority that killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand his divinity and what he, you know, he stood for. But the Vatican didn't look very favorably on one of your predecessors. Don Mario Mazzolini was excommunicated as a Catholic priest. Sure. Are you fearful that they could do that to you? Well, I don't really bother about those because what Swami wills will happen. So do they allow you to be a Catholic priest and mm -hmm. someone who has Sai Baba in your heart? My superiors have called me a number of times. I didn't tell you the story of, you know, but that's a long story. But my superiors had called me a number of times to ask me to renegotiate my position. <laughs> you know, you know, one of them told me that because they needed me, they wanted me, they also know. And then they told me you have to renounce him. Mm -hmm. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't worship two masters at a time. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I renounce him, I will drop dead. <laughs> 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 because I, it's like renouncing myself. You know, I, I don't want to be, to be, you know, I don't want to play hypocrite, you know, to be, you know, to be false to my inner self, you know. And then the other, another you know, superior called me and then said, okay, we're giving you a higher option. You know, <laughs> treat him as, as a, an intellectual thing. You know, of course, please go to the university and read, become doctor, you know, do their doctorate in his, his study of Islam, study of other religions, but they don't really believe those things. They know their faith is Catholic, you know. Treat him as an intellectual thing. Well, I said, well, Swami is not only in the head, Swami is also in the heart. Oh. <laughs> Swami is also in my hands and my legs. Swami is me. How can I treat him as an intellectual thing? You know, I really want to be fair to them. You know, really, really fair to them. Not to accept anything, you know, and then, they, like, if I accept, I'm not going to come here, come to India again to see the beloved Swami. But before this happened, I was teaching Swami without calling Swami. In the pulpit? In the public. And it was a boom. You it were not mentioning his name, but you were talking about his lessons and his love. Name is not important. The important thing is the reality. The love. Love. God is love. God is truth. God is righteousness. And this righteousness is in everyone. I integrated Swami's message in the very you know, uh, uh, milieu of the gospel. And it was like an explosion of consciousness. People from all over came. People were booking for, the, for my, where I'm going to say mass. And I, I was going all around. So, the, so did they ask you to then renegotiate one more time? How did they allow it to end? Your superiors, the superior general. They, I mean, they don't know what to do with me. <laughs> 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 so, so, so I, I, you know, and I knew, there was a time I really wanted to resign from the Catholic priesthood, you know, and to be, to be, um, to be just for Swami and concentrate on Swami's work. Then Swami has started ignoring me. Remember, after that first interview, <laughs> I went through her. This, I'm not going to tell the stories here, but I went through a lot of stripping, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, real passing through the fires of cru the crucible. And then Swami, um, 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 what was that? What was I? Uh, you went through hell. He stripped you bare, and uh, he wasn't paying you any attention. 
and you were still trying to make up your mind about what to do with your superiors. Sure. I wanted to church. resign. I wanted to resign from the Catholic priesthood. I wrote a letter to Swami. And I, for almost one month, I was trying to give this letter to Swami. Swami would not collect it. Trying, even when he's so close, he won't collect it. And I said to him, well, Swami, whether you like it or not, you are going to get this letter. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I was tired. I was tired of all this. There was also times when I was really, really, I passed through dark nights of, of, of my soul in this moment. So I went to the courier and then couriered to Swami, couriered the letter to Swami and told the lady that this letter is very important to me and I would want the receipt that Swami has received it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they said, that's no problem. I mean, they are going to deliver it that morning and in the evening around four or five that I should come and collect the receipt. So four o'clock I went and then they had delivered the letters in the, the morning letters. And then she brought the slips, which were about 20 or few, uh, 25 you know, slips. And she started, one, two, three, went around first, went around another time, went around the third time, and her face changed. <laughs> she couldn't find my slip. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, is either you find the slip or you produce the letter. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, she called the person who went to deliver the letter. Uh -huh. And then the person came because they, they, they have the receipt that they have received my letter. But they didn't have the receipt that it was they taken. Have, it was taken. So you can't beat Swami in the game. <laughs> you can't beat him. <laughs> so he didn't want me to resign from the Catholic priesthood. And if he didn't want me to resign from the Catholic priesthood, it is only when he wills it that they can excommunicate me. If he doesn't will it, everything is in Swami's hands. We have to realize this. It doesn't mean that we should be careless. But what he wills happens. You might think it is you doing. He is the one doing. <laughs> there was a time I wanted to run away. I tell you this story before you ask a question. There was a time I wanted to run away, run away to the United States, and just because I was tired, everyone did you know abandoned me. I didn't want to take permission from Swami, so I just planned. If someone invited me, so I just planned to to go, and everything was ready. Then when I went for the for the to the you know embassy for the interview there. It was a lady who was to interview me, and she was, she was nice. She was beaming with smiles. Because the first question she asked me was, are you a priest? And incidentally, maybe she was a Catholic. So she was beaming with smiles. She said, yes, I'm a priest, because my documents say I'm mm -hmm. a priest. Then she asked, by the way, before I went, I made a prayer. I didn't know when I made the prayer, because I didn't want to take permission from Swami. <laughs> 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 so I made a prayer to Swami. I said, Swami, Swami, beloved Swami, you are in me and you are also in her. So, you go, you ask the questions, and you answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so when I entered, the first question they asked me was, are you a priest? I said, yes, I'm a priest. Then she said, how many sacraments are there? Sacraments. Whew. Oh, I, I forgot. <laughs> 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 and she was totally surprised. And she asked another question, how many years have you been a priest? As if to say, well, if you have just been ordained, maybe we can pardon you. So, and I said, four, with pride, I said, four years. <laughs> <laughs> four, and she became more surprised. And then she asked the second question, how many parts of the mass are there? I forgot. She was giving you an examination. Because... <laughs> I had, I had written my dissertations on, and papers on the Holy Eucharist. Liturgy of the World, Liturgy of the Eucharist. I forgot. And then she looked at me with surprise and said, well, you have to come next time. And he, she stamped a stamp of refusal. <laughs> so while I was going... She wouldn't allow you to leave. <laughs> while I was going, I said to Swami, Swami, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have come to realize that what, it is only what he wills that happens in your life. And if he doesn't will it, nothing's going to make it happen. So there's no need to try to make things happen. Because what will happen will happen. Whether you, no matter what you do to make it not to happen. 
And what will not happen will not happen, no matter how you make it to, to happen. Father Charles, as we draw this to a conclusion, and people might be seeing this for the first time, and they hear your wonderful story about being in love with Jesus, being motivated to become a Catholic priest, listening to that inner voice that's been your friend for so long, and now you've introduced the figure of Sai Baba, who might be new to them as well. Who is Sai Baba? Who is the one asking the question, who is Sai Baba? That is it, because without answering that question, it is impossible to, to comprehend, to understand the reality of Sai Baba. Who is the one asking, asking the, the question, question who, is, who Sai Baba? is Sai Baba? In other words, who are you? Mm. Because Sai Baba is you, is the self in you. Without realizing the self in you, you can't comprehend his reality. This is very, very important. It's like, for example, you say, I am. I am dead. I am Charles. <coughs> I am her husband. Huh? I am her his father. Who is this I am mm -hmm. that is taking all these paraphernalia? Without discovering the root of your own reality, it is a waste of time trying to, to know the reality of Sai Baba. He also said it, that even if you are to study half you know, millions of lifetimes trying to comprehend my reality, it is a, a mere waste of time. For you to know me, you have to know yourself. Actually, it is the only the spirit can know the spirit. You are a professor, for example. How can the child in the primary school know you are what? It's not possible. It's only a professor who knows the what of a professor. So the task is, let's look deep into ourselves. Let's get to that inner consciousness that is us. Swami says, don't worship me. When you worship me, you put me out as an as a idol. You, you project me out of yourself. I am you. You are me. We are one. I know it. You don't know it. And that does, is the only difference. Does the same thing hold true for Jesus? Sure. What is that Jesus? Jesus is the I am in you. God is the is pure existence. Everyone say I am. I am. Who is the I am? When Moses asks ask God, what is your name? When I go to the Israelites and they ask me, what is your name? What shall I tell them? God said, when I you am. go, tell them I am has sent you. And everything that says I am is God. This microphone is saying I am, otherwise you can't stand there. The seat you are sitting is saying I am, otherwise you can't sit on it. <laughs> Everything that says I am is pure consciousness. And can it be completely compatible for you to be a loving, serving Catholic priest and still be a follower of Sai Baba? Does that mean? Can you be both? There is no boat. <laughs> when you see both, then there's a problem. It is only one. Only one. When there's only one, there's no contradiction. Because it was only when you have you know, complexity that you have con contradiction. God is only one. He comes in forms. He takes names. You have so many names, Dad. Your wife surely does not call you. I heard her when she calls you, when she called you honey. Isn't it? Is it honey you can call? <laughs> isn't it? And you answered, isn't it? You had so many names, but you are one. God has so many names, but there is one undivided reality. Consciousness. I know how the Holy Spirit changed your life, that voice inside. I know how Jesus has transformed your life. How has Sai Baba transformed Charles' life? Love, pure love, unbounded love, selfless love. That is why when you meet Sai Baba, you meet Jesus. So filled with compassion. Jesus, Jesus' love is, is incredible. He loved you as you are. See the, his, the, the experience when, when the Jews wanted to stone the, 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 the woman that was, was caught in adultery. They wanted to stone, him to, to stone her today because the law prescribed it. 
But just before they did it, they wanted to test Jesus. Not, no, just they wanted to test him and see what he will say. And they asked him, Master, we've got, got this woman in the act. And our law prescribed that such a person should be stoned to death. What do you say? And Jesus bent down, writing on the ground. And then after a while, he, he looked at them and said, If there is any one of you who had not sinned, let him be the first to throw the, cast the first stone on her. And then all of them, starting from the elders, bent down and walked away. Dropped the, the stone started dropping until Jesus was left alone with the woman. And Jesus lovingly said to the woman, Woman, has no one condemned you? And she said, No, master, none. He said, Neither do I. Go, don't sin again. Father Charles, as we say goodbye, if you had a chance to, of all the stories I've heard you say, and of all the examples of Sai Baba and from being a seminarian and the influences of your father, if there's one message that you could tell the world at this moment about hope for themselves, what would it be? Be happy. Our father is here. The, the, we are passing through the most auspicious, gracious moment in the history of creation. Not just history of mankind, but the history of the whole creation. God, in his full embodiment, is here with us. Why worry? Be happy. Be. Being is that, that emptiness whereby you allow, allow, allow God to take over you. That is my message. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Sai Ram. Yes. Could you mix spirituality in your form? I told you the story of when Swami told you to get a seat for someone. In the interview. Mm -hmm. Who couldn't stand? Who couldn't sit? The, the, the greatest thrill of my life. He was following me. I didn't know I was trying struggling to get out of the seat. He pinched.